so okay guys uh, so we have few people who have joined we uh, we will have many many more who will be joining so let us uh, begin this um, discussion guys who are there uh, please uh, raise your hands just to confirm whether you can hear us or not yes i can hear you can you hear me pardon can you hear yeah yeah, yeah. so uh, if a uh, panelist i'm i'm not i'm not muting you so but just in case at your end if there is some sound disturbance coming from the background some kid trying to howl or dog and uh, trying to bark so uh, just mute yourself uh, <laughs> and um, so okay um, so welcome to the first episode of our um, extra bites session um, i was looking at the name and i thought extra bites is going to be the app name because uh, uh, we want to uh, the particip the main speaker to share uh, something extra about himself which we usually don't know so um, we only know and see the work of um, the master but story behind that and story into his journey into photography is something mostly uh, missing so most of us sometimes <clears throat> don't get to know that so um, just to begin with uh, give me let me give you a brief about uh, what is exploring lights so exploring light um, is a company in photography education we uh, conduct lot of workshops and photography tours uh, uh, all across the world include india and abroad um, and i think this it is this particular thing that we do brought me in contact with yellow so um before i get into that introduction story um, let me introduce everybody the panelists so we have radha krishnan chakya who is uh, um now a photography educationist and he is running his company pixel village he has been he's multifaceted guy um he has worked in um, his uh, malayali movies as a hero and hey, no man <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's a little too much okay okay so well i have not paid him to do say that okay director <laughs> artist um, anyway so so he's and he's been into uh, commercial uh, photography for quite a long time a quite successful one at at uh, that and now he's full time into uh, creating content for um, providing photography education to all the desirous photographers and um, then we have subramanian pv um, um i know him as a portrait photographer and i also read recently that uh, he was also into wildlife to begin with so wild side of this world <laughs> so uh, so he's um, settled in us he's right now he's logged in from us only and uh, then we have uh, sharmista who's uh, a social documentary photographer and um, so i try to bring a panel which is um, which is uh, almost diverse i i i am just um, um, i'm just conducting this webinar so don't talk about me right now and you know um, just to give you some insight into what he is uh, how we met because um, in 2030 early we um, as a company we really suffered a lot of losses and that time i was only uh, uh, and we had to close down one company and that time we were already in discussion with uh, um, hasselblad in between from the company that that was uh, um, that existed earlier and then something happened and the partnership broke and everything hell broke loose and um, uh, somehow we had to start a new company in middle when they all agreed yolo agreed and um, another person from uh, hazelblad when they agreed to come to india on my request uh, they still decided to come despite all the um, um, difficult challenges challenging things that we were going through and it was so nice of the of them to have come and uh, i think that was the first and probably the last hazelblad workshop that happened in india and that was in the may uh, that was in the month of may 2013 and we did it in delhi and we did it in mumbai back to back workshops and phenomenally successful workshops and that is how i know you know and i decided to approach him and uh, 
blink of an eye and he said yes and i was i was honored thank you yellow for for uh, considering the request it was a pleasure yeah and uh, yellow let me um, let me take uh, sorry uh, the, the the live that you're going sorry excuse me the live that you are the feed that you're feeding into your youtube is just your face so maybe you can put uh, the entire screen there so that yeah so now it's it's just just my face so see if you can add everyone because the youtube viewer has still not seen yolo uh how do i do that any any idea uh let me just check because uh, you stream on youtube okay no copy stream link uh if you do share screen i have already see this is streaming live so um just a minute speaker view now do the now now is it visible now i can see only sharmista i can <laughs> this is back again so okay. our star of the day is still not visible ah now yeah. i can see the entire screen this is looking good okay yeah. okay, okay. okay okay so so what so what we will do is uh, let me just um, open up the page you know yeah and okay. Uh, okay. Um, so so what so what we will do is uh, let me just um, open up the page you know yeah. okay and, uh, so so what so what we will do is uh, let me just uh, open up the page okay now yellow is uh, so i just open i can hear the echo somewhere I can hear the echo. Can you guys please can mute yourself, everybody? Can you mute yourself? Guys, participants, please mute yourself. Can you? Guys, participants, please mute yourself. Just a minute. Let me find out. Everybody has been muted from my end. Uh, mute. Just a minute. Um, Please check if there is any other web browser tab in your own computer which is playing back something. Okay. Is it okay now? Yeah. yeah, gone. Okay, so um, so I'm just sharing screen just to show. Uh, okay, so Yellow is an Italian creative director and photographer based in Rome, Italy. So um, so he runs one of his biggest photo studios in Italy, and the last decades he collaborated with several international advertising and communication agencies such as J J W T, Saatchi and Saatchi, Leo Burnett. Young and Rubicam, BBDO, United Day, One Eight Six One, Gray and Blossom Communication. Now you can go through his website. That is one wonderful website. Um, so he's been featured. His work, in photography, has been featured in New York Times, Communication Arts, Panorama First, Vision, Vogue, Russia, GQ, Russia, and all these names are really big names. um um let me read some selective things in 2010 he was awarded best best international photographer during the exhibition photo vernissage so uh, one is this and then in 2011 the italian magazine l'espresso chose along with other nine young italians creatives who have been asked to tell through a picture of 150th anniversary of, anniversary of the unification of italy and in 2019 he won the prestigious lewis liblia award with his street photography and that is that is one another um thing about him so just i suggest everyone goes through this so he is uh, actually a leica ambassador and he's also since 2017 an elling chrome ambassador as as well so if you go through the list of his clients that is amazing 
and uh, so before i actually begin um my my question um to elo would be that i go through your website and i see you are a portrait photographer you are an advertising photographer you have done lot of creative art as well conceptual photography also have you have done and you are wonderful street photographer as well so who is elo uh, elo is a is a photographer with uh, a lot of curiosity that loves photography so much you know when i was young uh, many people told me you have to do one things and do it very well and they were right but life is one you know and uh, i said okay i don't want to do only one thing i love photography i like to take pictures of people i like to do creative photography i like street photography so i understood that i, I love people so i tried to uh, study different genres that involve people that is around people so people are the center of my photography but with different approaches as you can imagine to shoot a portrait a classic portrait and to shoot uh, a famous actor for a magazine is completely different but every different disciplines it's connected to the others so doing street photography helped me to be a better portrait photographer because you know for example when you do street portraits you're working in very complex environment when people don't expect you to take a portrait of them and you have to be very good to connecting with people and this experience you can use it also when you are in studio for example when you do advertisement you have to be very good into light uh, in all the technical parts and uh, that kind of experience then can be useful also when you do a simple portrait because photography is a mix of techniques and human human energy human spirit and uh, culture so let's say that uh, i am a photographer that likes to take pictures of people this is the center of my world others that that's wonderful you know so we will not uh, waste your time and everybody else's time so i start i request you to start your part now start sharing everything sure. about you and your photography and take us through some mind boggling images yeah over to my I'll do my best with 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 pleasure. So as I said, I started photography quite late. I was not very young. I was 28 years old. I I never think about photography before, but uh, I loved everything about images, illustration, comics, graphic novels, movies, but I never think about myself as a creator. Then one day I was able to see one friend taking pictures and as an external viewer i was thinking that those pictures were going to be very bad because you know i was without experience and then when i saw the actual pictures they were so good so incredibly good that i said wow look what you can do with this little box you know and then i felt in love with photography and was like an illness you know i had to take pictures of everything and everybody my friends hated me you know i started to take pictures of family friends and so on like crazy and since i was 28 so i was already a young adult let's say i i understood that if i want to improve into photography i had to study very very hard so i started to experiment everything techniques approaches reading a lot and after one year i understood that this should have be should should be my work and i started to try to get my first clients and so on It was not easy I remember the first the first 5 6 6 years were terrible but working with very low equipment with no resources with a very bad studio was in a garage helped me to develop uh, let's say to be used to work with very very few resources and also today that I can work with incredible cameras with uh, a very big studio I still use a very simple approach I prefer simplicity as a way of working of course depend on the project but anyway i prepared the presentation i will share my screen here yeah. we are <clears throat> let's share so this is my world it's as you can see there is a person in every every type of photography i do i do advertisement that means i do photography for 
agencies and clients that need my images to sell products and services. I do editorial photography. That means I, I shoot actors, sport people, celebrities for magazines. I do classic portrait photography. Again, I can do that for an actor as I can do that for a lawyer or any professional that needs a portrait to tell something about uh, his person or just for the joy of having a, a nice portrait. I do fine art photography. It's a form of creativity. I don't have actual client here. I mean, I do that for myself. And then I try to sell those pictures as an expression of my inner being through the fine art market. That is a very difficult kind of market because it follows rules that are completely different from commercial photography. The only reason why you can buy uh, pictures into the fine art market is because, or you fall in love with it and you need it because when you buy it, it's like bringing home something about the artist, something about the person that made it. Or you do that as an investment because you think that this piece of art is going to get value over time. And then I do street photography, that it's just about getting your camera, putting it on your neck and just going on the street, trying to find some beauty to build some content using reality. As you can see, this is my studio. It's a quite big studio in Rome. We have a limbo uh, on the top right images. So you can see the top corner. Those are our offices. I use the plural because my studio is made of five people. It's me as a main photographer. Then I have two assistant, one communication manager and one uh, um, 3D graphics specialist. I actually do all the post-production of my pictures. I also do three-dimensional graphics, but sometimes I need the help because as you can imagine, maybe we do a campaign and then I start to do the post-production, then I'm, I, I get hired for another work and I need my assistant to finish the post-production. This is funny pictures of my equipment. I am a like ambassador, so I work with like a cameras. Uh, I work it with any kind of brand in my life. I don't think that there is a bet better or a best brand. Now every brand makes beautiful camera. It's very difficult to find a bad camera made today. Of course, your camera is something personal. So it's about how you feel it in your hands, how you feel confident in the, in the instrument. So everybody should just use the camera that fits his work and his style better. And I, I found in like a very good partner to work with. And uh, this is my office, a big mess, as you can see. On the left is my computer station. In the middle is for Netflix and movies. And on the right is for video games. I am a nerd. I like to, when I am a little bit stressed, this is the way I try to relax myself. Going back to, to photography and to what I do. Advertisement, it's, it's quite complex because it involves a lot of preparation. It's about solving problems because when you do that kind of pictures, normally, you have to find the right budget, the right timing, the right people to work with. And uh, mostly of the time, especially in, in this period, uh, timing is the most critical. In the past, when I was doing campaigns like that, this is a campaign we made for Ford Motors. We use it to have uh, maybe one week, 10 days to shoot something like that, to prepare it, to organize the models, uh, to, 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 to try to understand how to do it. Now, normally we get two or three days, no more, because companies, they just uh, understand that, I mean, they just give you the, the okay to proceed at the last minute, because they are very, it's very critical to manage budget. And sometimes they really don't know until the last minute if they will do or not the campaign. So when you have to do that in three days, it gets very important to understand exactly all the process. Normally what we do is to do some, very fast test, hire the models. We, know, we are also a small production company. So normally we, we manage all, my studio manage all the parts from models to uh, organize uh, the shooting, catering, uh, hiring any kind of professional we may need like makeup and stuff like that. And to do that in three days is quite complex because we took the pictures of the camera, of the car in the morning of the second day of work. 
first day to organize, the second day to do the shot, the, the shooting, morning, shooting the car environment, afternoon, shooting the models, and the third day we do the post-production. And it's like not sleeping for three days because there is so much work to do, it's incredible. Anyway, I will show you some advertisement images and then later on I will have some backstage to show you how we do them. This is for Samsung Galaxy with the Olympic team, Italian Olympic team. This is for Philip Morris. Again, for Philip Morris. Many, many advertisement work are, are made mixing different techniques. For example, there is a lot of post-production. As you can imagine this picture, the actors with the dog was one picture. The woman with the helicopter was another picture. They were shot in separate moments, about 10 minutes one from the other because it was too dangerous to make the people run. But we actually shoot them on the mountain. So what you can do here is the mix of two pictures and some post-production for coloring and stuff like that. This is Oxido, it's a wear advertisement. It's like beauty photography. What is important is uh, how clean is the image uh, and to shoot in the same time very well the subject and very well the, the, the glasses. And glasses are complicated because it's full of reflection and stuff like that. This is for Casio, again, mixing photography with 3D graphics. So I shot the guy and then we made with 3D software the liquid metal to make it like it's moving on the skin. And also this company, this is the, the, this is the last campaign we made and we had to do that in about three, three and a half days. I go fast with through the advertisement. All of them, as you can imagine, have different kind of problem, different kind of approaches, a lot of computers. This is something that may look sometimes distant from photography because there are, it's more like engineering because we have to mix so many different aspects, you know. But at the same time, the experience as a portrait photographer helps because in any campaign, even if it's everything so, let's say, uh, how you can say that, it's all, it may look not so natural, you still have to take pictures of people. You have to manage anatomy, you have to manage the way they look, you have to manage all the parts related to the pose, and you have to light the body and the shape and everything in a way that it's, it's beautiful and harmonic. Of course, this is a group work. I do the pictures, I manage and organize everything as a director, but then there are a lot of other people involved, stylists, makeup artists, art directors, and so on. So I want to show you how we normally do those pictures, how we do that. This is the Ford campaign, as we say, that there is a guy that it's like going to swim because the campaign was made during the ch world championship of uh, swimming world championship. So Ford was, was one of the sponsors and they were creating a campaign that mixed the new car, the Vignale, with uh, swimming concepts. As you can imagine, the first things we do was to shoot the car. And we had a few hours to do that. And so it, since it was so complex, we decided to go with LEDs. LEDs light are small, light. You can keep them in your hand. So it, it's very dynamic. You can see exactly the actual results. So for example, in this picture, we are taking pictures of the interior. One of my assistant is keeping the main light while we have a second light on the bottom of the car to light the, the interior from, from the bottom. And some external LEDs to make, to do the fill light of all the environment. As you can see here, I'm, I'm still shooting details because as you can see, you know, for example, I was shooting th this part of the car to make the girl the girl swimming on it. While be, when I was shooting the other part, this is the actual pictures with the detail. So I was shooting with very open aperture and uh, I was trying to, and I had to use a camera with a very, with the possibility to focus very near using a wide angle lenses. I used the SL and for some pictures, this is again the car in my studio. I used also the Leica Q that has a 28 millimeters full frame 
camera that opens to 1.7. So I was able to have some very nice depth of field, even if I was on a wide angle. After we shot the interior, then we moved to the actor. So we prepared a setup with lights compatible with the interior car lightning to make sure that when we mix at them, it looked natural. So we defined every single light position. And when everything was okay, the position was perfect, then we put some water on the actor and we take the shot. And this is while I'm shooting a very fast cut up, just made just to understand if the perspective was working so that I was able to go to say to everybody, okay, it's finished, everything is done, we can go home. The very good things about doing all the tests while you shoot is that when you go home only when everything is perfect. So it's very important also to have the client. When I began to do advertisement photography, I didn't like to have the client on the set. But after a while getting experience, I understood that the clients on the set helps you to about being sure that when you say stop, it's finished, everybody's happy. There is nothing worse than to do the work and then the clients look at it and say, no, I don't like it. You have to do it again. Can you imagine how dramatic could be that, you know? with so much money involved, then you have to do the shooting, call the models again and stuff like that. So from this point of view, having the client that look at your work and can make all the correction on the set helps you to work better in a more, more safe way. More pictures of the actors and then several days of post-production and we build everything. And all the campaigns are the same. This is also a makeup campaign. As you can see, there is a girl in some Metro of course, it's not easy to rent a metro or a train. So this is again post-production. When you do that kind of pictures, you have to do first the background and then the model because you cannot match the background over a model picture while it's easier to match a model pictures over a background. So we normally do the background first. Yeah, we have the background and then we shoot the model. As you can see, on the right, there is the actual pictures of the model. We build that, that square box that you can see on the behind the model. This is made to have some sort of reference for the perspective, because we need to understand how the perspective is working so that everything match. So have a reference helps to define all the equilibrium. And then it's about post-production. And the most critical part when you do that kind of joining pictures that came from different moments is the point of contact of the foot with the floor. This is very important that has to be realistic because if this part works, then even if the per picture is not perfectly in perspective, your eyes will feel it like it works as something that it's realistic. If the content is not working, then it will look like a cutout that doesn't work and is terrible. As you can imagine, so uh, this is again another campaign. This is for Cream, for Bionic, a campaign, international campaign. And again, as you can see, this is the actual pictures. And this, so, and then what you see is, is post production on the left. And we build the body out of uh, several pictures. So we took the main body from the picture you see on the right, and then we took part of the arms from other pictures. And we put some plexiglass on the ground just to make sure that we have the reflection elements to be inserted in the final picture. This is a Pepsi Cola bottles with an Italian soccer player, Cannavaro. This is with Valentino Rossi, the world champion of uh, Moto, uh, MotoGP. And uh, again, as you can see, this was shot in a very, very huge place. Valentino Rossi didn't want to come to our, our studio because he was involved in other projects. So we rented this place in the north of Italy. This is the group of people that was working. Normally, when you do advertisement, there, is, there could be really a lot of people. In some shooting, I remember I made some shooting with more than 50 people involved. So as you can imagine, more complex is the shooting, more people needs to be involved in the project. And since the car is not real, because this yellow car was not 
yet ready this model. This was a specific model and uh, we needed it to be in the pictures. We decided to make it in 3D using the CAD reference from, the, from Opel. But at the same time, we had to shoot him and we asked Opel to send us a car that has the same height. So Opel sent us a similar model with the same kind of uh, structure so that uh, all the sitting of Valentino Rossi are, was going to be compatible with the final three-dimensional project. We shot him with uh, three point lights to make it more volumetric, more three-dimensional. And then this is the actual, the actual final pictures. And we did the car in 3D. So as you can see, this is the actual model. It's a CAD model that Opel sent to us because they have CAD models because they, they pro, pro, this is the way they build cars. They do that them in 3D first. And then this is the, the rendering we made. And to do all the rendering, we use Blender as a software. It's a open source software is incredibly good for three-dimensional graphics. One more campaign before we move on to another kind of photography. This is for Sky Television, another quite complex campaign. As you can see, it's a mix of computer graphics and, and portrait. And this is how we shot it. So we took some elements separated first the athlete, then the actor. And then we mixed all of them together using some stock photography, some 3D graphics and some compositing to just make everything harmonic to have the final campaign. So actually when we look at magazines and we saw these campaigns, normally we give to a kind of advertisement as it's right, just one or two seconds and then we move on with the page, but there is so much work behind that kind of photography. Then let's move on. We have editorial. Editorial is a completely different world. It's about taking pictures for magazines, normally of famous people, and uh, as you can imagine, there is very, very low money involved. It's not like advertisement where they have very big budgets. So when you work in editorial photography, you already know that you will not be able to, to, to have a lot of budget for post-production. You can do some color correction. You can do some, uh, let's say, uh, liquify, some skin correction and stuff like that. But of course, you cannot build structures and 3D and stuff with computers. So, the actual pictures has to work very, very well. And I do that for the music industry. This is a very famous Italian singer called Giorgia. This is, those are the pictures I made for her album and for magazines. And as you can see, I, I was working in a very simple way, just ambient light. I normally work with a fill light, like a flash on the ceiling and a second light to make it more moody. And then the second day, we took some pictures of her in another environment with different light. And as you can see here, I have some backstage pictures. We were shooting into a very vintage kind of environment. This is a, a place that is possible to rent in Rome with different kind of room with different kind of style. And I was mixing the warm light of lamps with blue filtered LED light to make some sort of warm, cold kind of effect. Again, we have some pictures here for JQ Magazine in Russia. She's a model for an Ukrainian model shot for a fashion shooting. Again, fashion shooting for JQ Magazine. JQ Russia, again, a fashion shooting about fetish. She's an Italian TV presenter, Italian actors, soccer players. I do a lot of celebrities and all of them, the, the dif most difficult part about taking pictures of celebrities normally is that they, they don't give you a lot of time. They, they may have like five or six shooting for different magazines the same day. So you have to manage everything in a very, very fast way. You have to enter in contact with them. You have to have some empathy. You have to understand if they have particular needs at the same time, you have to have a good light and everything has to work. And you have to do that maybe in 15 minutes, half an hour, no more, sometimes even less. So to go there, it's very important. It's very important to have 
some sort of experience so that if there is some problem, you can solve it in real time. It could be that the location is not working because not all the time we are able to see the location before or any other kind of problems you, you can meet. And this is incredibly hard sometimes, even if the pictures may look simple. This is an Italian actress, again, for Icon Magazine. Both are panelists that I shot for the TEDx, that is um, TED is an international, uh, let's say, speakers that talk about any kind of uh, technological, environmental, and scientific uh, topics. And I, I work for the Italian TED, and I have to portrait all the speaker all the time. And again, I choose it to shoot the speaker just a few minutes before they get into their panel, because this is the moment in which they are best dressed. I was shooting them normally during their hair cell the first day, the day before, but they were dressed very bad. They were not dressing for the picture. So I decided to, to move on and to shoot them just a few minutes before the panel. And so I had to be very fast. Again, I'm using LED lights, as you can see. So I have my assistants that help me and I mix LED lights with, with ambient light. Sometimes I shoot on tripod, as you can see on the top left pictures, because, and this is the right pictures, the, the, the example, and because uh, sometimes my assistant is into the picture. So I shoot the picture with the, the panelists and my assistant visible. And then when I finish, I keep the focus on the same depth of field of the original portrait. And I take a picture without my assistant and without the panelists so that I can make a pictures of the background with the same depth of field. And then I mix them with Photoshop to remove my assistant out of the pictures with a mask. <clears throat> I do a lot of sport people pictures photography again as you can imagine, all those pictures needs really, really to be done in a very fast time. This guy is an Italian champion of MotoGP and uh, he just gave me a few minutes to take the picture. So you have to manage the background, lightning and all the aspect in a very, very fast way. Italian actors, singers, and those are again for magazines, different kind of magazines. I do a lot of travel magazines portrait. <clears throat> I do a lot of work with dancing. And as you can imagine, it's all about people, but every time different problem, every time. You, if you have to do sport photography, you have to understand sport. If you have to do dance photography, you need to understand a little bit of dance because otherwise you will not catch the right moment. You will not understand when even the needs of your subject, you know, and so it, what it takes is that a photographer that wants to work with people in different environment has to develop not only empathy, but also a good degree of culture in specific subjects. Because this is really important to make sure that you understand what you're doing. It's not only about aesthetic, it's also about contents. And I go forward just showing you some more pictures that I shot for magazines. Those are dogs of fam Italian famous people, celebrities. And again, portraits for different editorial project. This is Jorge Lorenzo, one of the world champion of motorcycles. Again, for a fashion magazine. I took a picture of his, his actual biography. I was taking those pictures for Sport Week magazine and he enjoyed the pictures. This actually was the cover of the magazine. And he told me, do you want to shoot my cover for my book biography? I said, okay, but he asked me, I want a very powerful position, not a classic position like with hands on my chest or, I don't know. He want, I want something original. So I started to the, to trying to understand what kind of position I could put him. And then I went to his uh, hotel room because we actually shot this picture in his hotel room. We removed all the painting from the wall and we used some LED lights to put to make the lights. I had a fill light on the top and one side light to make him a little bit more volumetric. And I told him like, put your hands like that it was not easy. So I, I worked like 
working on a mirror. I was showing him with my hands exactly how to move it while I was shooting with the other hands. And he didn't understand me in the beginning, but he, he trusted me. We took the pictures and he liked it very much. And then he asked me, hello, this was a very cool picture. How did you imagine this position? And I started to talk about uh, stuff like classical painting and sculpture, just to make my choice a little bit more important. But actually, I have to be honest, I had different kind of reference, as you can see. I was doing something a little bit more, let's say, uh, getting out of movies. But, you know, a photographer can get inspiration from everything, from movies, from comics, from books, from poetry, even looking at people on the street. Everything is a suggestion because we work with anatomy, we work with people look, we work with people, uh, let's say, uh, empathy. And from this point of view, you can have several, many references. Anyway, moving on, I want to talk to you about portrait photography. And this is a different kind of approaching uh, humans because uh, when you take uh, an editorial portrait, it's still a work in which there are so many people involved and there is a mag magazine that exactly wants something that it's requested, uh, like they want to see the clothes because sometimes there is fashion involved or there is the agent of the actor that says, I don't want him to be shot from the right, it's better you shot him from the left. So there are some constraints. While when you work with portraits and it's a personal work that gets very much more deeper, more personal and your vision can go out a little bit easier. And so this is the kind of, uh, let's say classical portraits I like to do. In that kind of portraits, I have a very, very simple approach. I, I really like simple light that for me, simple light doesn't mean bad light. I like the way a single lights move along the skin and how the shape is formed when you have a single light. Sometimes I mix ambient light with some LED lights to just make some filling one with the other. But in general, I kind of have a very simple kind uh, of approach. And so, as you can see, every portrait is a different story because everybody's different. I don't use one way of working. Instead of developing a method that I use with everybody, I prefer to develop some sort of skill to understand as fast as I can how people is, how people react. Because, you know, every person is different. You cannot use the same scheme for everybody. About scheme, I'm talking about the way to relate with people. Because portraits is not only about light and beauty and aesthetic. Beauty is about trying to understand the potential of your subject and trying to, to stimulate the subject to change, to give you something different, something unexpected. And you normally do that with the conversation. And conversation is not only about talking, can be about silence, can be about just looking them in the eyes, could be about understanding the right rhythm. The way you talk, the moody kind of speech you have, the way you speak with your people, with your subject, the way you try to manage the conversation can give you completely different results. Sometimes when I need some elegance and some beauty, I try, I start to speak very slowly with a different kind of voice because into a slow approach, there is elegance, there is hidden into that. Because as soon as I get slower, my subject follows me. You know, uh, a portrait photographer has to have a very strong ability to stimulate change in other people. And to be, it has to be a leader during the section. You have to develop trust, but at the same time it's about power. It's about being able to make people follow your suggestion and to get into your worlds, you know? It's like dancing, it's made by two people because when you dance, there are two people involved, but one is following the other. One is the master, one is the follower, like in every dance. So, and the photographer has to understand and to move from one role to the other in a very dynamic way, depending on the kind of person you have in front of you. So I try to be as open as I can 
it's portrait is something that I really take seriously. And for me, every every time I shoot, for me, it's like a performance, because I know that it will depend on me. The results is not only about techniques; it's also about being able to make people different. I never ask to somebody to smile. I never ask to somebody get serious. I never ask something. I just stimulate change with conversation. So if I want them to smile, I have to be funny. If I want them to be serious, I will talk about something serious. If I want them to look lost, I will not talk for a while. I use my voice to make changes. And then I try to record those changes. I try to create something that like a base on which then I build an experience for my subject. As you can see, it's a mix of ambient light and studio lights. I, I like to work in both environments. This is something that I don't prefer studio or ambient light. I really love both. I like creative portraiture and I work in both color and black and white. I don't really have a preferred one. Every time it depends on the kind of mood and story I want to try to build with my subjects. And talking about simplicity, for example, this is a portrait I was taking of uh, uh, an Italian TV actress. And as you can see, even if the scene may look complex sometimes we really use a very simple approach this is how we we made these pictures it, it's like it's like the movies you know you see very complex uh, results and sometimes it's just a very very simple approach and as you can see again i i love those led lights i like led lights because with modern camera where you can go a little bit higher with iso they are very very uh, powerful in terms of dynamics when an assistant keep one light in his hands, automatically you have a, a light that is moving with you. It's an intelligent light because it's, it's a human that is managing it. And I can communicate with my, my assistant and everything can be very fast. And if I need higher light, lower light, I can do that very fast. And I see the actual result in real time. And from this point of view, this helps me to make my light a little bit more cinematographic because imagine that I have a flash on a tripod and every time I have to move something, I have to move cores and batteries. A LED is so much faster. So I get used to it and this is a way of working I really like a lot. Again, here you can see one uh, of my studio setup why we are shooting. I normally have a couple of LEDs for backlight or fill light in my studio and then an assistant with the main light in his hand so that I can achieve different kind of... And you can, like in the pictures on the left, you can build shadows very easily. You can just put something in front of the LED and you have this side shadow. You want a backlight, you put a second assistant or a second LED with a tripod and everything gets very, very fast and dynamic. And this is something I really like. Again, some shooting. <clears throat> I also do creative kind of portrait photography. This is something I really like very much. I like to transform people to make stories a little bit more complex. And then moving on, we have fine art photography. As I say, this is something I do just for myself. I don't do it for any purpose beside telling stories here. It's like working as a writer, you know, you just use photography as a medium. And uh, one of my most famous series is Clownville. It's a series of clown. I started to shoot more than 10 years ago. They are not actual clown. Even if we have uh, one of the most famous clown in the world that participate to the series, but is the only real actual clown, all the other people are just normal people. Some of them are famous actors. Some of them are just friends. Other people I just met on the street and I like their face and I asked them to be part of the series. Some of them are very famous photographers. I never tell who is behind the mask. It's a secret. And uh, 
what I like about that is that uh, <clears throat> the mask is like something that uh, helps me to transform people. When people have this mask, they, they get so free and they express themselves in a way that I was really not expecting. I started, honestly, as something that was just related to the aesthetic of clowns. And then let's move on to Clownville. Here we are. And then after a while, I understood that the mask is a powerful tool to make people more free of express themselves because when they have the mask, they actually feel free to give you something more. And from very shy people, I got incredible uh, performance. They got naked, uh, they showed me, they, they cried, they screamed, they were moving their body in an anesthetic way that you normally don't do in front of a camera because you're shy or you don't want to show this part of yourself. But as soon as you have a mask <clears throat> that looks like it's hiding you, it's not true, it's, it's freeing you out of any, let's say, <clears throat> things that may block you from express yourself. And so the mask helped me to have uh, incredible performance by my subjects. And everybody was just <clears throat> showing and moving and looking and expressing the self in a way that was really unbelievable for me. <clears throat> and so I decided to keep doing the series. And now it's more than 10 years I made <clears throat> a lot of them. And every time I find that somebody is interesting as a subject, I just ask them to perform for me. And this is something that it's, it's doing pretty well. <coughs> <coughs> I had many magazines showing the pictures. I made many, many show internationally. I'm selling a lot of pictures in the fine art market. This is something that it's, it's really working and I'm really enjoying as an experience. <clears throat> Sometimes I make also some black and white version. And <clears throat> how, I, how I do them, I normally envision a story. I do a sketch, very simple one. <clears throat> and then I choose my actor that as I, can, as I say, can be really anybody that just makes me feel comfortable with the idea. <clears throat> and then I ask them to be the hero in this story. And sometimes the picture match exactly my idea. Other times people give me really unexpected performance and what I get, it's so distant from what I was thinking, but it's so incredible that I decide to follow my instinct and to just shoot what I'm receiving from them. And this is giving me some incredible <clears throat> results and experience. As you can imagine, also those pictures are shot in a very simple way. I have some backstage pictures where you can see the setup. We are mixing ambient light in this particular one with a diffuser and <clears throat> some bed light made with some portable battery flashes. Others are made in a very simpler way because as you can imagine, sometimes simplicity it's just a secret to make very, very strong images. As you can see, for example, with this clown, it's just lighted with one single little LED right. And this is the actual result. And uh, okay, here you can see that I love all my subjects. I give you, I give them a lot of kisses when we finish, if they want it. And this is sometimes how I build my pictures. This is, I was uh, having a dinner with a friend. This guy just made this sign to his girlfriend saying, come on, smile to me. They were having some little discussion. I like the gesture. And I told him, oh, wait a moment, Marco, can you, can you show me that again? And I took just a very simple mobile picture. Then I bring the pictures to my home. And with Photoshop, I made some painting, digital painting, basic one, just to understand how his face may transform as a clown. And when I said, okay, there is something interesting here, I invited him to do an actual shooting. And this is the final picture. So as you can see, as a portrait photographer, I'm always looking for inspiration, always looking at people because people is where everything starts from. And from the way they move, the way they talk, 
I can get a lot, a lot of very good suggestions for my work. As I said, uh, Clownville was very successful. We made uh, shows in Brazil, Italy, Russia, Germany. So I'm very happy about the result. We were inserted in a very famous fine art series called Icons 5-7, together with famous photographers like Steve McCurry, Barbieri, and Christian Cravo. This is the actual object for the fine art market. And incredibly, the series was so successful that we found at actually right now 29 people around the world that made a tattoo out of our pictures. And we were so surprised starting to see and find those pictures on the internet. And this is from all over the world. This is from the United States, uh, Italy, Japan, Thailand, uh, African countries, South America, more than 29 people decided to have one of our pictures on their skin forever in their life. And this is really something incredible. And we are collecting them because they tag us. And so we discovered them. And now about every week we are finding one, a new one. So this is really incredible. People that are drawing them, illustrators and so on. And then to finish about my work, I try, I try not to be too long. Uh, let's talk about the last kind of photography I normally do that is street photography that I really love because as you can imagine, street, it's something that I do alone by myself. While the other kind of photography, I always need the help of makeup artist or stylist or I don't know, assistants. When I do street, it's just myself with my camera in my neck. And street photography is something that I really enjoy because it makes me feel free. I like to walk. I like to stay between people. It makes me have some sort of meditative kind of uh, uh, wellness to my spirit. And so I try to do that as much as I can. And as I said, it's just getting your camera, putting it in your neck and going on the street to take pictures. This is shot in Japan. And every place I go, then normally I travel for workshops. I do a lot of international workshops or I travel for an, an advertisement campaign. And then if I have some free time, I go to shoot some, some, some street photography. And uh, street photography is about, you know, trying to look at common things, you know, everyday things like people, street, cars, objects, and to find a new perspective to connect things because you know, using the frame that is a very powerful tool for a photographer, you create relationship between elements that naturally are not related. Like for example, this shop with the, the drawing of the, of the wings and this old woman that is just walking there in the exact moment. So it's about timing, it's about understanding the power of different elements, it's about graphics, it's about creating stories out of one frame. I call my pictures in street photography, my one frame movies, because you, everything has to start and finish in a single frame. Street photography cannot be a project because street photography, it's about randomness, vision, the ability to understand a little bit in advance what is going on and all those things together, always is like throwing dice. It's every time, a new story. So a street photography pictures has to work as a single element. If you want to make a project, then this is a reportage, you know, because you decide to have a project, a project. You may have a street approach, but it's still a project. It's not street photography. While street photography, from my point of view, is just about single images. Of course, when you have a lot of single images in your archive, you have years and years of pictures, then look at all of them you can see and find some patterns and you can decide to make a book or to make a show or to make a, any kind of project, putting together pictures from different moments to create a new narrative. But still, this is not something you can do before. It's something that happens after you, you shoot a lot and you have a very big archive. So I keep shooting. This is Germany, this is Morocco. And every time I try to find a way to create 
harmony between elements, to tell stories made of one frame, but with so many people in the frame. And as you saw, I can do nearly everything in post-production. I can really build the pictures from scratch. And while I have this ability, in street photography, I really maintain a classic, nearly analog kind of approach. If the picture is good, it's good. If the picture is not working, I failed. This makes myself having so much more fun to do it because it's so easy to build the pictures out of several frames and to say, okay, I, I build something, but this is not the spirit of street photography. The only kind of post-production I do on those pictures is what you can do in a dark room. I don't eliminate object. I don't clean them. I don't retouch skin. I only do darkening and widening parts. It's like dodge and barn, you know? What you were doing when we were developing film, just the same approach. And so every time, everything I, every time I fail, I feel the failure so strong, but this pushed me to be a better photographer, to make things a little bit more, trying to push the bar higher to get better. Street photography is about failing. Failing is normal in street photographer. You get good when you start to fail less, but you still fail a lot. But into the failure, you have to find your, your style, uh, you have to find your approach, your method, you have to find the reason to try to get better. And this is something that really helps me a lot in terms of, uh, of energy and uh, to, to just move on and keep going out and, uh, and so on. And this is Roma, again, Rome, Cuba, Malta. As you can see, I have a very strong Japan. I have a very strong graphical approach. This is something that I like. And uh, while for the Taliban of street photography, street photography has to be candid. Candid means that there is no interaction between you and your subject. And, and most of my photography are like that. It's just about getting the moment, understanding the power of elements in the frame to build something that has narrative content in it. I also really like street portraiture. That, as I said, for some street photographer is not part of street photography, but the history of street photography teaches us that a lot of street photographers took portraits in their life. Vivian Meyer, Bruce Gilden, even Meyerowitz took some street portraits. So this is something that I normally like to do. So what is street portraiture? It's about asking people to take a portrait on the street. Let's move on to some of the portraits. As you can imagine, taking portraits is not easy because you, know, you, you just stop a person on the street and you tell them, you know, I want to take a portrait of you because I like your face, the way you're dressed. I like the relationship between your figure and what is behind you. And every time is a different story. Every time you have to develop a strategy to communicate with somebody. And this is really interesting because make you get better at talk with people, at relate with others, at relate with stress. Because sometimes we just feel stressed to, to, to understand what is the best way to reply to answers like why you are shooting our shoes or why you are shooting my legs or Type like, or why you took a pictures to my child or to my dogs and stuff like that. And all that, it's something that you learn on the street because every person needs a different answer. I'm always very honest. And when people get mad at me or they get upset, I try to calm down them and to make them more relaxed and to understand what I'm doing. Photography, portrait photography is about persuasion. A portrait photographer has to be very good to persuade people in studio and outside of the studio. And when I'm not able to make them understand, we just do, did something nice and they want me to delete the pictures, even if, for example, in Italy, laws say that they cannot ask me to delete the pictures. I delete it because I want to respect people. I like people to be happy. I don't want people nervous on the street. I do that for myself. I do that for the other street photographers. And if I'm not able to persuade one person, it means that I have to be a better persuader. I have to be 
better in communicating with people. I have to improve my empathy. And doing that, I think I get better as a human and as a photographer. And for a portrait photographer, your human side and your technical side really mix together. So what I want to say is just closing that, as you can see, all my work, it's just related to my, both aspect, human and technical. Mm -hmm. And this is making my life so full of joy at the same time, giving me a lot of professional satisfaction. So I just uh, stop the sharing here of my pictures. I hope I didn't talk too much. No, I think uh, we, we left somehow stump, uh, uh, dumbstruck that uh, I, I know that you have many more images and uh, so we would have loved you to keep going on and on with your wonderful images. And uh, I am spellbound. So I've been a huge fan of your work ever since we, we met. And the first person I thought of uh, contacting for this kind of series was, was you. And glad that we are starting up with you. Um, so um, I, I think we, we will head to the panelists uh, very soon. Um, I have a couple of questions, but let me ask first sure. question, uh, um, that I just jo jotted down a couple of questions. One is uh, you work at extremes. So on one hand, you are shooting advertising stuff, so uh, which is um, advertising campaigns which require extreme kind of post-processing and manipulation and a lot of stuff is going on. We've already seen that. And on the other hand, you in between portraits and all, but then coming to the other extreme, which is street where you don't even manipulate anything. Is it easy for you to really switch so fast or how do you manage? Uh, is it some kind of mental psyching that you do for yourself or it just happens? No, it just happens. Honestly, it's not something that I have to work on. Of course, as you can imagine, I think that it's like a balance, you know, moving from one to the other, keep me on an equilibrium. Because if I were, I think that I was going to do only advertisement and engineering kind of photography with a lot of post-production, I may felt a little bit disconnected from people and from reality, you know, because this is so much, pro sometimes taking the pictures is really the most simple things in an advertisement project. It's all about managing people and organizing all the technical aspects. And then if everything works, you just press the button and it's done. While photography is not only that, there is some sort of romantic approach to photography that I, I like to keep because I enjoy, I studied on classical authors, you know, and uh, their experience, their lives is something that I want to experience myself. So going around with just my camera in the neck makes me feel uh, a free man in a free world, you know, and something that really love. And so I think I need both, you know, not too much of one. It's like doing a little bit may put me on a balance and probably also from, let's say, a spiritual and personal point of view, it makes me feel, enjoy life more. Yeah, that's fantastic. Wonderful answer. Any, anybody from the panelists would, would like to ask so that, yeah, yeah, PV. Yeah. So thank you. That was uh, absolutely amazing. And, uh, uh, you know, one thing you validated for me is that, uh, uh, you know, you don't have to kind of choose a particular genre because I've, like Jesse said, when he started, I shot all kinds of genres. Right now, maybe I've come like, you you know, people, weddings and uh, portraits and uh, that kind of stuff, street. Uh, but thank you for validating that. Uh, but my question is, having worked with, uh, you know, Steve McCurry, Elliot Irvitt, uh, and others, uh, what, is, there, uh, is there something you consider important uh, with relation to working with uh, masters and experts uh, in terms of mentoring or uh, is there something to it? Uh, or, you know, you could probably in this age of Google and YouTube, uh, you can, uh, you know, learn everything online uh, or do you think mentorship plays a part? Okay, uh, I, I, I think you, you say something very clever. And uh, let's say like that. It's true that today you can learn pretty everything on YouTube. Uh, I don't think uh, all the human uh, culture and experience is there if you know how to search it and how to look it on, the, on YouTube or any other, on the internet in general. 
what I learned from those masters was not about techniques because, you know, working many years with Steve McCarry or with Elliot Terry, it was difficult in the beginning to really understand what was behind their shot. Even if I was spending so much time with them, because, you know, I remember I, I started to look at the camera, how they set it up because I was thinking that the secret was there, you know. I started to think they had some special cameras with secret features, you know. I was because I say I was looking at them shooting. I say it's just that, and then I understood that what they are very different between them. You know, McCary, Natchway, Elliot are totally different, but they have something in common. Yeah. They are incredibly strong mentally. They never go home without the work done. And if they need others to help them to do the work, they're able to persuade others in a way you cannot imagine. They are so yeah. psychologically strong. Even if one is more calm, the other is more funny, one is more serious, but they all have the same mental approach that is about strength, you know? That doesn't mean that they are uh, not funny to work with, but it's very tiring to work for them because they are always 100%. It's about mental energy, it's about concentration, it's about working on the result. And this is something that they teach me. And maybe this is not easy to find it on YouTube, to understand it. Yeah, and I, I think two takeaways from that. One is that, uh, you know, when you work with people, uh, you imbibe much more than just photography. I think the, the whole character, the personality and, uh, you know, what comes with part and parcel of that. And second is that it's less about technicalities and cameras and, uh, you know, settings. And it's way more about, uh, you know, the picture in itself. Uh, you know, the whole... I tell you, you know, if we have to talk about techniques, uh, McCary, naturally, uh, Elliot, they often work with the camera on P, on program. Yeah. This final answer. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, sir, Mr. Radha, sir. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hi, Yolo. It was amazing. Uh, the work is amazing. Of course, I saw it much earlier. And the way you speak and the way you convey uh, the, the feelings, emotion to, you know, uh, uh, here is it's, it's just amazing a little lot of takeaways from it and i'm going to rewind and watch this again because every time i think uh, whoever is not participated in this uh, session is going to lose something uh, anyway fortunately you're going to have it in the internet uh so thank you very much uh i learned i learned a few things from this conversation one thing i wanted to check with you is all your photographs be it advertising uh, portrait work fine art or street there was an element of drama in it, dramatic. Even the portraits were not just portraits. There was an element of drama in it. Um, is there any, and, and, and I, don't, I don't remember seeing any single picture without any drama, okay, in, in your work. So is there anything to do with you as a person? I'm sure there is, but... I know that you're a creative director. I heard it from your resume that you're a creative director. And I'm assuming that you are an advertising creative director. I'm assuming. But is there anything there to it more than the creative director? Is there anything to that approach to photography from your childhood or from your early, you know, the way you were brought up or the kind of people that you came in contact with? Is there anything there prior to you becoming a photographer? I'm pretty sure there is, but you know, probably I, I should do a few years of analysis to understand it deeply. <laughs> but uh, I, I am quite, you know, uh, if you ask to my friends, uh, when I, in my social, let's say, uh, interactions, I'm quite uh, bright. I like to have fun, I like to say stupid things, to make jokes. But at the same time, I think that inside of me is a little bit different. So what you can, this drama you can see in the pictures probably is my inner aesthetic, you know, is the way I really feel about everything around me. That doesn't mean that I am a negative kind of approach or a dark person. It's just that I love that kind of seriousness in my pictures, you know. I like to make people look important. And so from important, I mean, I mean serious, I mean to look at something that, uh, to look at the future in a way in which the future is something important, you know. I always have this scheme in my mind that probably 
Uh, it's something that I cannot avoid to do because it's part of the way I look and the way I feel. So probably the way that, that it's moving through all the pictures is that probably is my way to express myself, even when it's more difficult, like for example, in an advertisement work where you have so many inputs that you have to follow. But at the same time, so I'm happy that you saw that because I, it took me a while to understand it. You know, often people say, why in your picture people don't laugh so much? And I explain them that it's because I laugh too much all the time. So I need to, to put back some seriousness into my world, you know? <laughs> Probably that, I don't know. But in general, it's true. It's true. You, you, what you said is absolutely true. It's part of my, my inner space, probably. Thank you. Thank you to you. Shamista? <clears throat> yes. Uh, hi. Hello. Hello. Um, hi. <laughs> we are just flowed with the genre of work. I mean, so much you do. And I was just wondering, as you took us through so many um, categories of work, can you hear me properly? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So my question is, how do you jump from... Let's suppose today you get an ad advertising assignment and uh, tomorrow you have an editorial shoot. How do you manage? How do you juggle so many things? It's not easy. In terms of organization, uh, I am uh, pretty well organized. In terms of, I, I use a lot of tools to do my to-do list, to do my... So in terms of organizing the work, it's not difficult because I have uh, a quite pragmatic approach to work. In terms of emotions and personally, it's another story. I, I, I'm, I'm like every other human, you know, with experience, you understand how to manage those violent change because sometimes one day I am in Germany taking pictures to one, uh, I don't know, something like uh, a lawyer that hired me. And then the next day I'm taking pictures of an old man on the street in Sicily. And really those are two different environments, two different worlds. And uh, I had to work on myself a little bit to manage this. I, I try to sleep as much as I can when I'm traveling a lot, because even on the plane, so I often all my travels are doing sleeping because I, I need to recover, I need to reset my brain a little bit, you know? So it's a mix of, uh, let's say, very good organization in terms of tools. And uh, I have people that help me, of course, on my studio to manage uh, scheduling and stuff like that. And at the same time, I try to give my brain some rest to make sure that when I wake up or when I start a new work, I'm, I'm fresh. I try not to mix, you know, even if sometimes I have to because I, I am human, so I have my limits. And sometimes stress is very strong, but I learned how to keep with it. Um, and I want to ask you something because um... Out of all the work that you have um, presented today, I am basically biased towards portrait photography. And um, I, if, I'm, if I may say this, there is a little overlap between the editorial work that you do and the portraits that you're doing, because obviously, you know, you're shooting people and that's our main subject. So um, in portraits, like, is there something special that you would like to tell us a, a, a fan of portrait photography like how do you go about let's suppose how do you go about approaching a model what lens you normally prefer i saw that most of it is inside your studio with that simple lighting that you're saying and 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 spaces that you'd use two two lights you know um yeah. one handheld light and one on the side so how do you is there something special that you want to tell tell me about well, yes, yeah. let's say, as I said, in terms of uh, the way I relate to others, it's really depending on what the others are. And uh, so, as I said, I don't use a specific method. What I really do, I really observe the person deeply from the moment in which they are in my studio. I normally try, try not to talk with them during makeup. So when they go into makeup or any kind of stuff in which they are, I don't go there to know them better. This is not a moment in which I want to relate to them. I try to be a little bit distant in that moment. I start to relate with them just when they are sitting in front of me. That doesn't mean that I'm not observing them because I need to see even small details, you know, any kind of details can help me to make a successful portrait. And then I start 
the session always, you know, when I do a classic portrait session, I, I start simple. I make them sitting because sitting is a gentle way to help them to be less stressed. There is nothing worse for a subject that you just put them into a white limbo without any connection with the world, just standing like that in front of you, you know? It's like an interrogation, a light in your face, a white limbo behind, and uh, it's, it's terrible. So sitting is a nice way to make them feel more comfortable. And then I, I never start to ask for a performance in the beginning. In the beginning, I try to capture something that is unique because at the moment I start to speak and I start to ask for things, they will, they will change in a way that probably will never put them back in their natural, you know, uncomfortable position. And sometimes in that beginning moment, you can really record something interesting, you know, you know, not giving them too many information, they will feel maybe lost. They will just look at you saying what I have to do. What I have to do is a question that sometimes doesn't need to have an answer. I like sometimes to make feel them uncomfortable, even if this can make me lose a little bit of their trust in the beginning, but stressing them, working on the line of some risk helped me to have a better results. And then as soon as I see that what they're giving me is not interesting or I have enough of that, then I start to interact in a much stronger way. And uh, this is just about creating, you know, mental structures. I, I may really change my voice in a way that it's, in, it's really strong and may, I may surprise them or I may even speak in a way that they don't understand me. Have you never tried to say something that people don't understand you because you actually say nothing? They look at you with a strange look, you know, like what you say, they, they turn your face, they make their eyes like that and boom, I take a picture and then I smile and then they say, oh, you joke me. I say, no, this is serious. I bring back in a serious and they think, oh my God, this is crazy. And then I make a joke. I stress them. I want them to be, you know, to feel that they don't understand where I'm going. And then I stop, silence. I start to talk again very slowly. And then I, I slow down the, the conversation. And then they start to move slowly because when your voice goes low, their body goes slow. It's connected. Can you imagine a photographer that talks very slow and the other side, the subject that moves like crazy? It doesn't work like that. It's a connection. And voice is stronger than eyes in portrait photography. I think it's my main tool is my voice, is the way I can manage all the equilibrium into the, in the shooting section. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much. A pleasure. Anybody else would want to ask? Otherwise I can move to the participant questions. Let's see one more question. One yeah, more. Please, Sorry, please. I'm, I've got too many questions. I just I don't know what all to ask you. It's too right. much work. Um, what is your favorite lens for portrait photography? I like all the macro lenses. Uh, so let's say 90 macro, 105 macro, because they have a lot of details. And, uh, you know, adding details is difficult. Removing details is easy. So I prefer to start with the pictures with a lot of details, even if I may shoot in a way in which details are a little bit sacrificed, but in general, I like to start with a sharp lens. And what I like of macro is that there is, a, you can focus much near. So I feel more free. If I want to give very near to a subject to get just a one detail of the face, I can do that. Mm -hmm. If I want to work uh, more distant, I can do that as well. So normally I use macro lenses around 90 millimeters. This is my favorite uh, portrait, let's say headshot kind of lenses. Thank you. Great, great. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll move to the first question. Um, it's an interesting question from Prasanna Shanmogam. Would you like to come, Prasanna? Um, let me... Um, you, can, you can on your camera and... Uh, would you ask, ask the question yourself? And his microphone. Just a minute. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Prasanna? You there? I have unmuted you. If you can just on your camera and you can ask yourself. You there? Or should I ask? Okay, so if he comes, all right. Uh, so he says that thank you for this session. It's really amazing. My question here is with the abundance of technology and gadgets flowing each and every day, how are you updating yourself? 
also personally did uh, you did you do any projects with very minimalistic gears for example mobile cause moving along with multiple gears as a threshold point i believe so one part of answer which i already know and i think he has also shared is the use of minimal lights that we've also seen in our workshops in delhi and mumbai and we were really surprised to see him operate with almost one or two led lights and and that's it but um, would you like to throw some um, more light on that you know so in, in general let's say that uh, i i i shoot with the mobile phone as everybody i never made a project with a mobile phone actually i i may shoot uh, i always have a camera with me i like to bring me uh, normally I, i bring with me a very small rico gr3 it's a very small camera that you i like to use it also for my street photography so if i shoot with the mobile it's just for fun with friends uh, actually i never shoot important pictures with a phone but i'm not against it i'm i'm i saw incredible project made with a phone it's just not for me it's it's personal but i would not i would not uh, i mean if somebody one, one day will ask me to do a, pro, a commercial project with a mobile i will do that with pleasure i just don't feel comfortable especially when i have a camera in my pocket so i prefer to use a camera in terms of uh, the way of uh, i manage gadget and stuff like that i have to say that uh, I, i know i think that you can do good photography with any camera i'm not saying that you need an expensive camera to do also because today consumer camera are much better than the professional cameras of 20 years ago so i mean what today you could do a, an advertisement international campaign with just a consumer camera and i'm pretty sure you have everything you need at the same time i am a little bit of a nerdy kind of people so i like technology i like to talk about cameras and i don't uh, i'm not shy to say that i like i like my objects you know i have some sort of connection with them is the, is the instrument of my work I, and uh, while i can i i can really tomorrow you can give me another camera and i still will be myself i don't i don't feel i will be a different photographer at the same time i'm really connected with my book so that's all. that's my my answer yeah wonderful there are many um, participants who are asking um, that you seem to prefer black and white now see the yeah. things more than over color and portrait specifically and even street uh, there are quite a few of them have asked this so any any particular thought behind that and uh, yeah actually you know a few reasons the first one is that i shoot a lot of advertisement in color you never do advertisement in black and white it's very rare so uh, this is a way i can i i love black and white it's very very moody and uh, very graphical so the first reason why is that it's a way to do black and white is to do that on my personal work so street and portrait then because uh, when you do street photography color is an information and since it's an information it's not always fine to see the correct scene with the correct color that are matching so you may find a scene that is very strong but then you have the color part that doesn't work and uh, you know especially in in occident is not like in india south america where there are so many colors and it's easier to find connection between color in the gray occidental cities it's color you can find a car all the people are dressed black or gray or white you can find some color in advertisement on the street all elements that are not very interesting to build your picture so black and white give me the possibility to shoot better pictures because it's difficult to find the right colors it may it's a layer of difficulties that makes things not, less easier and last i studied the street photography and portrait on classic authors you know and so i have some sort of romantic connection with that kind of classic approach so when i think about portrait i like to think about august sander elliot erwitt and all photographers that were working in black and white and the same with street photography so i have a deep love for black and white that that's the reason i'm actually shooting also color i'm just not showing them because probably i don't have a huge portfolio yet but in the next i don't know i will take pictures for 30 40 more years i hope probably there will be some color street photographer as well okay wonderful um there is another question from ajinkya jumre uh, would you like to ask ajinkya yourself 
let me try and see if I can uh, uh, allow you to. Okay. Um, just a minute. Ajinkya, would you like to come on yourself? So in oh. the meantime, I just have a quick question. Yeah, please. Uh, where do you draw inspiration from? I mean, uh, from ad shoot, uh, probably ad shoots, you already have a directive from the agency and, and stuff, but let's say you're doing portraits or let's say you're doing uh, your own, uh, uh, you know, portfolio work. Uh, where are you drawing inspiration from? Well, I, I, many, many, many different ways. You know, I take my inspiration. I think if I should, if I should, choose one, only one, I would say all the illustration world, more than the photography world, because I deeply love what illustrator, illustrator, graphic novels, you know, comics, this is something I really like and something that drive my attention. But then others photographer, there are so many good photographers around that makes incredible things and this always push you to do better. And uh, movies, painting, I, I, I'm very visual as a person, you know, I, while, as I said, for portrait, for me, my voice is the most powerful tool for expressing myself, for learning my eyes. I'm, I'm a very visual. I spend so much time every day to just get, sometimes maybe even too much, because now it's very easy to find visual information. But this makes me, you know, gives me probably a lot of uh, inspiration, even in a way that I may not understand completely. Sometimes it's just passive. And then after a while, those things come back to you. You mix ideas, you mix things to create something new. So let's say that uh, besides graphic novel, nearly everything, even the way you are sitting now, you're putting your hand in front of your mouth for me, could be a suggestion for a portrait I may shoot maybe tomorrow, who knows? Thank you, thank you so much. So, so there was this question from Ajenkia. He's he says that uh, you know, can you monetize street? So, or is it just for your personal this thing? Uh, hello. Uh, okay, uh, I, I am. I, I found a way to monetize it, but uh, street is a poor kind of discipline. You know, it's you can monetizing doing uh, selling your work could be a way. If you get very strong as an author, you can make books and you can sell some of your works to fine art galleries. I, I do a little bit of that. Of course, you cannot make a living out of it. And then uh, I teach it. So teaching it is another way to monetize it. Besides those two things, there is a third way that is a good suggestion, I think, for professional photographers. Putting street photography into my portfolio made my corporate presentation more interesting. You know, in the past, when I was going to work into corporate project and I was showing my, like, for example, go and take pictures of workers in Africa of uh, their building, maybe a dam or any other project or do some corporate reportage. When I was showing only my portrait and advertising work, I was not getting the project or the assignment because they were thinking that I was working to something too specific and not able to connect with people, you know? Then putting my street photography inside my commercial portfolio, selecting the right pictures, made them understand that I am also able to document reality, to work with people, to connect with people I don't know. And so they started to trust me. And since I put my street photography in my commercial portfolio, I started to get a lot of corporate assignments. That's, that's fantastic. Um, so anybody else wants to ask? I, I have a couple of questions. I think that will help um, all the people who are attending. Um, I think in terms of your advertising, um, there is one question which I always um, had in mind that these days budgets are getting squeezed. Clients do not want to give you too much. Um, everything has a comparison, everything has relativity. But yes, um, budgets are not as they were used to be. At least that's what the um, understanding is. How do you still manage to convince uh, on the budget or how do you manage to keep the qualities high uh, in your squeezed budget? So um, That's the most complicated things about advertising photography today. Unfortunately, uh, sometimes there is no, no way to convince them or you work for that budget or you lose the job. So if the budget is is so low that it makes you every all the project at risk 
because at the moment you say yes, then you are responsible for it, you know? So if I don't feel comfortable that I can do that work with that budget, I normally avoid to get the work. But if I think it's possible, and this is the creative part, you know, because sometimes, you know, you decide that, you know, you have a very small budget, you have to be creative to find solutions that makes things happen, even if you don't have the complete budget. And I enjoy this part. This is something that interests me. And it's a skill that I had to develop if I want to keep working in this industry. Because while there are still some very big clients, when you work with, I don't know, Ford or Pepsi-Cola, you still have interesting budget, even if they're much lower than before, but they're still big enough to, to organize the work in the right way. For middle level clients where the budget is sometimes very low, it gets very complicated to build a high quality image. But this is the difference probably between studio that are able to survive in this complex era and studio that has to change their kind of environment and client. So I decided to, to make, to find solution, to solve problems. This is part of the problem, part of the work, you know? And so let's say that we always try to find a solution to mix timing with budget and with a good results. It's not easy, but it's, it's our work. I mean, it's what we have to do. That's wonderful. And um, one more thing that um, in advertising, do you get to have your creative freedom or there is a lot of interference from the client and how do you manage it if there is? Uh, and well, you, let, let, fall in line with their yeah. thoughts. Well, let's say that when I call, when when is a client talking? I don't find it as an interference. You know, it's the client. Uh, it's not my work. I I I can really uh, completely cancel my artistic part and work as an artist. And I have, don't have problem. I don't have a big ego. If if they want something terrible, and they pay me for it, this is my work. I mean, I when I, I decided to work on as advertisement photographer, I decided to create a service. Service means that, of course, I try to do my best to suggest to my client an approach that I find right. But honestly, sometimes clients have their own idea. They want something very, very, very complicated from a visual point of view that may not work. But after that, I do my consultancy. I tell them that I think there is a better way. I then don't accept it. What can I do? I just do my artisan work. I do the best as I can to make them happy about my work. And uh, I may not put it on my website because there are many works I did for clients that I didn't like completely because maybe they were technically okay, but from a communication point of view or that, that I general aesthetic, I didn't like. But I have a photographic studio, five people working for me. And honestly, saying no to a work is complicated today. And from this point of view, so I just understood that working for others means also to accept some limitation on your vision, you know. Things that I don't do if I work for myself. When I work for myself, I, I just try to do the best as I can to express myself. When I work for somebody else, I, I may have to accept, you know, their vision. And this is something that doesn't make me feel uncomfortable at all. Okay, another wonderful. I think I think I'll close by asking one question which people have been asking. I think they'll be uh, finding it. Uh, they'll be waiting for that answer from you. That I, now I've also seen that when you click in your old portraits, there is there is that kind of intense look that comes um, uh, that you try and bring it out from your model. What advice would you like to give to anybody who's trying to get into portrait photography or who is already in portrait photography but is not able to make it um, what should he work on uh, to to become better in portrait photography any kind of advice uh, if you can give uh, okay photography is not different from any other discipline you know the problem of photography is that is it, it, photography is about lying you know Photography always lie, and that's because uh, photography is easy. You know, photography is easy for a simple reason, because 90% of the work is done by the camera. I know that photographer doesn't like to hear that. But uh, let's take somebody that never took a pictures. Anybody, just, I don't know, my mother. My mother is not a photographer. She doesn't know even know how to switch on a camera. Give a camera to my mother. And... If the light is good, she put it on P and you put in front of her a nice subject. 
anybody. She can press the button and she can make a picture that looks okay. Nothing bad, nothing super, but okay. It means beautiful, just simply beautiful. Now, give a pencil to my mother. Dress her like a ballet student. Ask her to do classical dance. Give her a piano to, to, to play something. It's going to be a complete disaster. That's the difference between photography and other disciplines. Is that when you take a camera, you have a copy machine in your hands. It just copies what is in front of the camera. The real work of a photographer is not about pressing the green button of the copy machine, because if you put something beautiful in the copy machine, you really receive a beautiful copy. It's about making sure that what is in front of your camera makes sense. It's about organizing, developing empathy, making something that is not just a copy, but that is unique because you, you change it, the person in front of you in a way that is unexpected. And to be an experienced photographer, portrait photographer, there is only one trick, is to take pictures of a lot of people, a lot of people. You know, always they say it's not about quantity, it's about quality. This is true, but it's about quality after that you've done 10 years of quantity. Then you can start to work over quality. But in the beginning, you have to shoot a lot, a lot. People that you don't like, because it's when you shoot people that you don't like that you get better because it's easy to shoot some beautiful people. You know, the picture I show with you is, uh, is my marketing portfolio, is uh, what I show to get my work, is uh, I show pictures of beautiful people. I'm not saying it's easy, but if you shoot only the people you like, you don't grow. If you shoot only the people that works in front of a camera, you don't really understand the real potential of everybody. Everybody deserves an important portrait. Everybody is possible to be portrayed in a way that he looks to his highest potential. And, you know, you have to stress yourself. You have to work in a way that makes you feel uncomfortable. You have to really prove to yourself that you are able to generate empathy with everybody, with strong personalities, with uh, uh, shy people and so on. So if I have to give a suggestion, before you call yourself a portrait photographer, shoot 5,000 people. And then we start to talk. Fantastic answer. Uh, you know, it's been wonderful having you with us because I think it's quite a... Uh, we just started conversation. We just started the conversation now. Yeah, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's just amazing. There's so much going All on. this while we were watching his pictures, we just started the conversation, but unfortunately we have to, I don't know. I, I, I just I want to stay. I, I told you five days. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> now I know what you mean. There's so much yeah. going on in my mind that I have to ask so many things. I don't know. Um, Absolutely. Um, because I know certain stories. Wish I had more time. Um, I, I know some wonderful stories that you have uh, while you're working. Worked with Steve McCurry, those funny stories and all. And um, But but um, I think we will have to now um, close. Yes, can I ask one question? Yeah, yeah, one last question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, sure. um, I would like to know, um, how do you approach editorial work? Like, how sure. do you approach editors? Is there a special tip over there for somebody well, who yeah. has never done any editorial stuff? Okay, uh, first of all, let's say that the editorial market is really in huge difficulties now because magazine doesn't have a lot of money. There is less advertising, less money involved. So it's really important that the photographer is able to, it's difficult that a magazine calls you to develop a content. Normally now photographer has to do their own project. Maybe they already need to know the actor or the celebrity. So starting from zero is very difficult. And doing money is very difficult. It's really a getting poorer and poorer as a work. Technically, I would say that it's always important since you don't have a lot of time to try to to understand the potential of your subject, to see the works of other pro, uh, photographers. So if I have to go to take a picture to an actor, I search on the internet to find if I see already how others colleague portrayed him just to have some visual suggestions. And if some of those colleagues, I know them, I even call them to say, how, how is this guy? What kind of person I will meet? Because any information I can have, it can help me to manage better in the session. You know, really, sometimes it's just like, I made a cover for an English magazine a few months ago. It's a very important financial magazine. And uh, this bank director gave me 30 seconds to do the portrait. 
So as you can imagine, in 30 seconds, and we were in a corridor, so mm -hmm. very bad location. He told me, okay, take me this picture, even if it was the cover, you know? I mean, the cover you should dedicate, but probably has more things important to do. So I decided to took a picture just with the lift behind him because the lift is made of metal and the light on the metal makes some nice, let's say, moody portrait. So I just made a very simple central light with a flash with him in the middle of the door looking in the camera. And why I did that? Because I already took these pictures many times. I was using experience, you know. I took a pictures of that maybe to a friend when I was younger and then I took a picture of that uh, maybe for an advertisement. So it was something that I really did. When you have not so much time, experience helps you, you know, because you try to use something that you already did in the past and just to personalize it with the subject you have in front of it. So as, again, shooting a lot helps. Thank you. Thank you, Elo. Um, so it's a I pleasure. Think, yeah, um, there's a lot going on, but I think we will have to um, call it a day now. Um, thank you, Elo, for, for actually sparing so much time, valuable, providing us with valuable inputs and uh, showing your phenomenal work with all of us. And uh, We wish to see you back again, probably, yeah. you know, if your time permits, you all of yeah, back pleasure. again in uh, his so channel. I love, to, I, I I love I India, promise, honestly. I, I love India. So I, I'm, I'm just here because yay. I love your time. You'll have to promise me that you will come again uh, very soon. Yeah. I'll call you again. Let, let's organize it. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Looking forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you so much, Yolo. And, 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 and everyone stay safe. I hope this kind of, you know, yeah. subsides very, very yeah. soon. We'll get out of our houses very soon. And also, we come out stronger on the other side of this event. Right. You we know, will. Very, we will. very, very. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you, all the panelists, and thank you, all the participants. And special thanks to Yellow again. I would love to have you again very soon. A lot of questions are remaining, so very soon. And thank you, Jesse, sir, thank for this Jesse. opportunity yeah, you, to Jesse. talk to, to, to Yolo on your platform and strength to you and strength to Exploring Lights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you very you. much. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you, sir, thanks, Mr. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, all participants. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.